Father in heaven, dear Lord, again, we thank you for your grace and your kindness. We thank you for your compassion that you have shown to us. Lord, we pray that you would be with us, that you would grant to us the Holy Spirit. Not for this message merely, but for our life, that our children may have a desire to know Jesus because of our influence, that our spouses would be encouraged by our faith and our love for you and our demonstration of that heavenly atmosphere, that our neighbors, that those we pass by in the grocery stores, and as we stand in these long lines, that someone would have a sense of the love of Christ for their souls. Lord, help us not to accept what is happening in our world as normal. Help us not to be content with theories and ideas that have nothing to do with the salvation of our souls and nor the salvation of those we come in contact with. Strengthen us, Lord. Help us to feel our need and the longing need of others to know Jesus. Be with us this night as we fellowship, as we study. Bless those who are watching. Fill their hearts with your love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as I've been, <clears throat> as we have been um, over these last few weeks, we have been looking at a, uh, um, a litany of things. Uh, there was a time when uh, a few weeks back we were talking about the challenge to evangelism. Before all of this uh, sheltering in place and, and, and um, uh, the uh, closing down, uh, cities being shut in and different things of that particular nature. And we talked about the challenge to evangelism. And brothers and sisters, by no means have God relinquished the, um, uh, the call to go to the world. Men have done whatever they are doing, whatever they can under the influence of the enemy to stop the, the proclamation of a gospel of not a, but the gospel that must go to the ends of the world. And as the COVID thing began to intensify, we started talking about um, Esther and we were looking at the example in Esther ta Esther's time as to how Satan was using Haman for the purpose of annihilating those who knew the truth, those who had access to the truth. And he wanted to silence their influence so that they could not affect the world as God would have them to. Because the prophecies had said that as they would go back and build, they would rebuild the temple not for their own glory, not for uh, them to inhabit, but they were to build these temples that the desire of all nations should come, which was Jesus, which we refer to as the desire of ages. It's Christ. Well, God is, is, is in a sense, going to open the gates, the two-leaf gates, as it were, that, that would seek to hold in the influence of the people of God so that they cannot do the work in which God has called them to do. But God is going to open those gates for the purpose that we too may go forth and bear to the world the desire of all nations is to come. We are to give the last warning message of mercy. And we saw how Haman, governmental powers, was 
was he had deceived as a hearers, but he was deceived by Satan because Satan had an agenda and his agenda was to silence the work and the influence of the people of God. And so today, when we look at powers around the world, they're deceiving and they're being deceived. But we said that while Haman was actively at work, Mordecai, which was to him someone that posed a threat to his prosperity, to his, to his leading uh, the people of Medo-Persia to worship him. And so God's people will be seen as a Mordecai in the gate that is, that is interfering with the influence of the modern day Hamans to bring about and effect a worship for themselves. And in this, they will seek to deceive the governmental powers of issuing decrees, issuing laws to destroy and annihilate the people that they feel are interfering with their global universal agenda. But what did Mordecai do? Mordecai did not focus on how Haman was raised. He did not focus on the fact that Haman was a part of a secret society. He did not focus on the fact that Haman went to the school and was trained by the modern, by the ancient wise men of his day or the Jesuits of our time. This is not what Mordecai focused upon. Mordecai said you to Esther, you must go in before the king for you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. Your influence must be put fully on the side of God and his people. No time to be in the middle. No time to be lukewarm. No time uh, 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 to be in a position of self-security. No time to focus upon your upon your 501s, no time to look at your religious liberty and your constitutional rights and all of these sort of things and, and all of these constitutional freedoms that you have, you cannot depend upon this. Don't think that just because, don't think that just because you sit in that position that you are going to be safe from what is about to happen in the world. See, you know, brothers and sisters, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that we must not think that Christ is coming just because we are beginning to feel hardship. We, have, we must not think that. We must not think here in America that just because we are experiencing some hardships and really it's nothing hard. It's just a little inconvenient when you think about it, when you compare with what's happening around the world. Go to Africa, go to Europe, go to the Philippines, go to Asia, go to some of the islands of the sea. You want to see hardship, brothers and sisters. You want to go, go to the Middle East and see what it's like to profess Christ over there. That's hardship. What we're experiencing in this country is just an inconvenience. But it is inconveniencing us enough to make us start to start questioning our position with God. But really, it's just an inconvenience. No one is barging in our doors. No one is telling us if we come out of our homes, we're going to be shot and killed. We don't find ourselves being, uh, 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 in some places, yes, some segments of society are being downtrodden. But now, all of a sudden, those of us who have experienced the more, the, the, some of the, some of the greater advantages of life because we're being inconvenienced. Now we want to start saying, well, Jesus is about to come. But if we go around the world, they have been experiencing trials for many years. And so we like Esther 
have been sitting as it were in the palace. And we now are somewhat believing that, you know what? I have been, I haven't been called in before the King. I can't go. But Mordecai said, don't think that just because you have a constitution that gives you religious freedoms, don't think that just because you have laws and 501s and all these, don't think that because of these things, trouble is not going to come to your door. Don't think because of your profession that you're going to be able to pray yourself out of these trials. You will have to, like Christ, yield to the powers that be. And so as we look at the situation or looked at the situation of Esther and Mordecai, of, of Esther and Mordecai, that we learn from that is that the people of God must go in before the king. While we're desirous to try to evangelize the world uh, through social media, brothers and sisters, there is a greater work that has to be done than just informing people of events. We have to go and mingle with people as God, as we see in the mission and life of Christ. He went into the homes. He didn't just send messages. He went into the home. He sat down with individuals. He, he, he ate in homes. He studied and, and he led people in their experience. And just like, and just like the men that came to the well where Jesus was. And they said, now we believe not because of what we have heard from you, but because we have heard them for ourselves. Peter following Christ's example went into the home of Cornelius. So we find brothers and sisters that God has given to us a very personal and practical work that must be demonstrated before those who we would save. So we have a vested interest in praying and asking that God would give us wisdom as to what it is we are to do in the times in which we're living. Because we're not going to be able to be sheltered in place and believe we're going to finish this work. We're not going to be able to be isolated to a point where we can only gather in small groups and finish the work that God has called us to do. We have to pray that God would open the door for the proclamation of the gospel, not for us to go back to business as usual, not for us to just be able to go to our churches and sing loud and sing and, and about an empty experience. We must pray and ask God and be definite and intentional that God would open the door so that we can get back into the communities and be a light and a lamp to those because the bushel, the light that God has given to us is not to be put under a bushel. And so as we understand these things, I believe that God is also doing something as he did in the days of Daniel. And brothers and sisters, as we seek to understand where we are in time, we, I don't want to look at isolated cases. In other words, I don't want to study about Barack Obama. I don't want to study about Trump because we don't understand. We, we hear these things and oh, this president is doing this and this one. And we all of a sudden, and then we're telling where people are, Believing that, hey, when this president comes, okay, this is about to happen. And then all of a sudden the president goes away and then it's like we're back to square one. And so we don't want to look at isolated cases. We want to be able to understand God's principles and how he lays them out piece by piece by piece. And God brings us to a conclusion because God's work knows no haste and it knows no delay. We don't need time to show us where we are. We don't need to tell you that Jesus is going to come some route, somewhere 2031 to get you encouraged to do the work of God. No, brothers and sisters. The prerequisite for doing the work of God is conversion, not preaching about time. We don't have to set time to encourage people, the people of God, to do the work. 
Those who have no relish to do the work of God, they need those times. Those who have lost the sweet influence of the Spirit of God and have lost their joy for just seeing souls one to the truth, they need these times. But we understand that when the soul is converted, as, as, as soon as the soul is converted, there's born within them a desire to make known to others. So that means when you and I are converted to Christ, that is the very influence that we need to go to the world and give this proclamation. I want us to notice in your, want you to notice in your Bible what the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 24. I want us to go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and brothers and sisters, not only are we to understand the message, we also must be in a position where we can teach this truth to others. I remember sitting in a home with someone, and um, uh, as a matter of fact, I was with, I was with someone else, and we were in uh, the city of Chicago, and uh, there was, there was a nurse that was coming by and she was taking care of one of the, 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 the um, patients that was, it was in home care. And uh, um, I believe it was um, Sister Latoya Davis and I believe it was Marissa Rice. It was Latoya Davis and Marissa Rice and they had met a gentleman and uh, a nurse was coming to his house for one of his family members. Another brother on the team was invited to the home and they were studying with him, was studying with, was studying with the gentleman and the nurse started joining in the Bible studies. And I remember, cause they were telling, they had told me this and I had visited sometime later and uh, they were, they were going through uh, Matthew 24 and they were showing all the different signs of Matthew 24. And when it got to a certain point, it says, uh, he said, now, Jesus is going to come after these things. And she sat on the edge of her chair and she was saying, well, what is the next event that lets us know that Christ wants, is about to come? She was, she was into it. And it was because there was a systematic studying of the word of God that she could see clearly where we were in the procession of ages. And many individuals that when you study with them in a very systematic way, they are able to look and say, wow, we are here. I had visited a church uh, in Waynesboro, uh, Georgia, where, we, where I live. I don't live in Waynesboro, but I was invited to a church, a Baptist church. And I remember I was talking with, um, uh, was going through a series of things. And, and I said, you know what, I, I, and I'm praying like, Lord, what can I share with them? And I said, you know what? And I, and I said, the prophecies of Daniel, let, I, let them see the prophecies. And so all of a sudden I, I printed out a, uh, a, uh, um, an image of Daniel chapter two. And I remember I showed up there and they was the man, they were, they were, they were into it. They were into their song service. And all of a sudden I gave to the usher. I said, can you start handing this out? And they were, they were doing their song service and they were up and shouting and I watched the ushers as they were coming, starting in the back and coming down, and they were handing out those papers of those, that image of Daniel 2. And every row that got those papers, the clapping stopped, the shouting stopped, and they were riveted in that paper. And I watched them go from row to row to row to row, and by the time it got to the front, no one was clapping anymore. No one was shouting. They were still singing but they were staring at the paper and they were singing. And I saw immediately that the Holy Spirit had their attention. And as we stood and as we went through the word of God and was showing them what this image means and where we are and how we're in the feet of this image. And Jesus wants to come. And as the appeal was made to give their hearts to Christ and be ready for these events that is soon to break upon us, the people were ready. They were ready to make a decision for Christ. And brothers and sisters, systematic revelations of truth will bring people to see their need for Christ. 
in an intelligent fashion, but yet in an intense way that they would have a desire to be ready for Jesus when he comes. So we don't have to focus on isolated cases. We don't have to highlight presidents and we don't have to highlight administrations and we don't have to uh, 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 highlight elections. But what we can highlight, brothers and sisters, is the word of God and how God's word does not change. And as we see things, brothers and sisters, we realize at the end of the day that regardless of what men says, they are not God. Nebuchadnezzar tells us that, that God does whatever, whatsoever he wills in the kingdom of men. And he giveth it to whomsoever he will. So we don't have to just sit back as idle spectators on the sideline. God's people can be active in it by their prayers. They can be active, brothers and sisters, as they plead and ask God to hold the winds so that God's word can continue to go forth. And God says that the king's heart is in God's hand and he can turn it whithersoever he wills like the rivers of water. But we focus so much on the individuals that we lose sight that God is in control. Notice you're in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24. Let's begin at verse one, Matthew, the 24th chapter, beginning at verse one, the Bible says, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. In other words, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus enters the temple of Jerusalem for the last time. He came there in John chapter two and he ran the people out. He says, my father's house shall be a, shall be a place for all nations. It is to be a house of prayer for not just you, it is to be a place for all nations. That means that God sets up the church for the purpose that the world might come in. He says, but you have made the church a den of thieves. And so people are being kept from the church by the church. Jesus shows back up in Matthew chapter one, Matthew chapter 21. Second time, and he runs them out of the temple again. And he says that make not my father's house and house of merchandise. They had made the church a place of profit. And this is what people are doing. Now, brothers, I'm not, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about those who profess to be God's people. They have made Adventism a place for profit. Just go to any one of your major events. Just go to any one of your major convocations and you find more people outside with their booths than you find inside studying the word of God. You find more people outside selling than you find people inside listening. People are more concerned about their books and their CDs and everything else being sold than they are about people receiving the word of God. And so they're making God's movement a place of merchandise where you can go and you can gather uh, these books and you can buy these books at prices that is reasonable. But what we're going to turn around is we're going to sell them. We're going to make the books and we're going to sell them at these exorbitant prices. We're going to, we're going to raise the price 10 times the amount so that we can make our profit off it. And so rather than it being something that we can read and share, it becomes like a cherished idol in our homes because we pay so much for it. We don't even want to read it. Paying, uh, uh, selling books for, uh, uh, two and, 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 and 200 and 200 and 300 dollars for books that you could simply go down there and buy a book for $30 and read it and share it. But see, we're going to make, we're going to make merchandise off of the truth of God things that you can actually go and study and read for yourself, I'm going to take it and I'm going to make a handout and I'm going to charge you three and four hundred dollars to come and listen to me about something that I've never done when you can actually sit down and read it and get more out of the book than you can get out of me giving you a handout of something. But I'm going to make merchandise over it. 
I'm going to charge you for what God wants to give you free. Why? Because I, hey, I'm, I'm in ministry. And so because I'm in ministry, guess what? I got to, hey, don't muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn. So I'm going to charge you for what God says, freely you'll receive, freely give. People say, man, uh, well, I don't want to go there. But the reality is, this is what they did in Christ's time. And brothers and sisters, this is what they're doing in our time. And so because in these days we would think that is inappropriate and it's unchristlike to go and turn tables over, well, guess what? The government has come in and turned the tables over and shut and closed the lights and locked the door. So now we can't make merchandise of the Word of God. No, preacher, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can create websites and we'll charge people for prayer We'll charge people for personal Bible studies and we'll charge people for material that we said the Holy Ghost gave us, but we will charge you for it. We want to make merchandise of the word of God. And this is what Jesus, when he came into the temple, he turned it over. He turned it over brothers and sisters and Jesus is turning it over now. And so what happens is, now he comes to the temple, Matthew 23, he comes for the last time. And then he looks at them and he said, he doesn't say, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. What he simply says is your house is left unto you desolate. Because Jesus never needed a temple to preach the gospel. We see that from the life of Daniel. We see that from the life of Joseph. We see that from the little maid. Jesus was never dependent upon buildings to preach the gospel and he is not dependent upon them now. And so Jesus looks and says, your house is left under your desert. I would have gathered you to me. He said, but you would not, you would not come. Why? Because your conference leaders wouldn't let you come to the truth. Your conference leaders banned the truth, banned you from going to the truth. And there are others who are the disciples of the Pharisees who to seek to influence people from going and hearing the truth. No, don't go and listen to them. Why? Because they're preaching on Sabbath. No, don't go listen to them because they are gathering without permission. And so they, they like the disciples of the Pharisees, they influence. And Jesus looks and says, you know what? Your house is left unto you desolate because God does not need buildings to communicate his truth. So what happens is, so in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is leaving the temple for the last time. His voice will not be heard anymore in that building. And so the disciples hear Jesus say, your house is left unto you desolate. So in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, they simply say, Lord, whoa, ho, are you serious? And they begin to point to the building. They begin to remind Jesus of the building. They begin to remind Jesus of quotations and, 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 and they begin to try to show Jesus and influence him to think that, no, you must not be talking about this building. You have to be saying that this is going to happen at the end of time because surely God is not going to walk away from this temple in our time. This has to be way in the future that God will no longer be found and, and his message will no longer be heard in this building. But notice what Jesus says in verse two. So context, Matthew 24, verse two. And Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then they say in verse three, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, disciples came unto him privately saying, Lord, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Surely this has to be at the end of time. When Jesus was talking about the overthrowing of the building, he was talking about how the government who has always had an influence and an insay and a say in the church will now show her full authority. Go in your Bibles 
Go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Look at Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus said he wanted to gather them, but they would not come. So in Matthew 24, he leaves. The disciples, they said, this has to be at the end of time. But Jesus is saying, no, listen, you have to understand something. The world has always had a greater influence in the church in this time than my, than my father has. And so now, notice, you're in Matthew chapter, matter of fact, hold your finger there. Let's just swing over to John chapter 11 real quickly. Let's look at John chapter 11. Matter of fact, before you go there, stop by John chapter 7. Stop by John chapter 7. Notice this very quickly, and then we go to John chapter 11, and then we go back to Matthew 22, and then we'll go back to Matthew 24. Amen. John chapter 7, I want you to notice what it says here, um, starting in verse mm -hmm. Matthew 7, and let's see hmm, where, where, uh, let's look at verse 45, all right, Matthew, uh, matter of fact, no, look at, look at John, pardon me, Lord, slow me down, John 7, look at verse 32, and then we'll look at verse 45, John 7, 32, and then look at verse 45. But John 7, verse 32, it says this, The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. The Pharisees and the chief priests sent what? Officers to take him. So the church is using the influence of the government to, in, to interfere with re church affairs. We have, we have seen this before, but notice what happens in verse 45. It says, the officers that they sent, verse 45, then came the officers to Christ, to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, why have you not brought him? Why did you not arrest him? Why didn't you shut his meeting down? The officers answered, said, never man speak like this man. What did Jesus speak? He offered to them the words of life. He said, come unto me, all you that thirst, and you shall drink for out of his belly, my belly shall flow rivers of water, speaking of the Holy Ghost. They were, they were held captive by the Spirit of God. When Saul sent people to, to Ramah to get David, when they went, what happened? The Spirit overcame them and they began to prophesy. And then Saul sent others and the same thing. And then Saul came and then Saul was, was taken by the influence of the Spirit and he too began to lay all night and prophesy. And it's so much where it says, is Saul among the prophets? And so because of the influence of the Spirit of God, brothers and sisters, this is how we're going to be able to affect the world by offering them salvation. When the officers came, Christ didn't talk about Caesar. He didn't talk about the abominations of Tiberius Caesar. He didn't talk about the, uh, uh, the pedophilia of of Caesar and all that was going on there. No, he offered to them that which would bring them salvation. But Christ gave them what he had. He offered them what he had. What would we offer the officers if they come? What would we tell them if they came knocking at our door to arrest us? Will we offer them the truth of God? Will they be so taken by the Spirit of God that they, would, that they themselves would begin to cry out like they did to John the Baptist? And what shall we do as they hear the truth being spoken? Do we have the influence from heaven, brothers and sisters? It says, now go in your Bibles to John chapter 11. Go to John chapter 11. After Jesus raises Lazarus, what happens there? 
John chapter 11, notice when the Pharisees and all the religious leaders met together. I want you to notice what it says. Be jumping down and let's read in verse 51. Notice what it says in John chapter 11. Matter of fact, not 51. Start in verse 47. Verse 47 and 48. Notice John 11, 47, 48. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And what? The Romans shall what? Come and take away both our place and our nation. Why is this? It is because any one that put himself or that was put in a place of authority above that of Caesar was considered treason. Jesus was put on the cross and he was killed because of treason. The Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. They disassociated themselves with God for this ultra political um, 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 national identity. And as a result of it, they had said, hey, we have no king but Caesar, they were more desirous as retaining their position with their nation and their country more than they were being associated with the truth. And so they would do whatever they can to protect their 501c3 and their corporation status. They would do whatever they could to protect their, their accreditation so that their schools can continue to get federal funding. They would do whatever they can to keep the legitimacy of their organizational structure so that they can be a place in the world. And brothers and sisters, you must understand that the reason why we have not affected the church, the world, as we ought to, is because there are active, literal agents and educators and officials who stand to shoot down every mention of the beast of Revelation 17. Don't have time to go into all that, but notice, let's go back in our Bibles. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, <clears throat> Matthew Chapter 22, oh, brothers and sisters, again, the things that I share, I pray, I, the things that I share with you, brothers and sisters, are not things I find on YouTube. These are things that are actually real and they're actually happening, brothers and sisters. They are actually happening. Things that we share, things that we say, it's not, we don't find this on YouTube. These, this, this is what is actively and literally happening. Not to say that everything on YouTube is bad. Not to say that what's, that's what's there, that everything is not true. But brothers and sisters, again, these are things that are literally happening. It happened then, it's happening today. Where are the people of God to stand? We need the indwelling of the Spirit of God. It says in Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22 here, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus gives a parable of he's inviting the church. He's inviting them to come and be partakers of this wedding feast. He's inviting them to come and, and, and to sit down with Christ, to take an active part in bringing others to the wedding feast. This is why he's calling them, not for them to come and sit down at the table and be warmed and filled. No, not while his field is empty, but he is actually calling us to become an active participant in the feast and bringing others with us to the feast. But we are actively, as a church, making excuses of why we cannot come. Our jobs, we are more concerned with our careers than we are with fulfilling the gospel commission. We are more determined and intentional when it comes to our finances than we are with our positions in Christ. Because we are more concerned 
and I'm dealing with church now. I'm not talking about the word. We're more concerned with what do we do with our children now that they're home with us because we have careers that we're trying to advance. We don't have time to be home with our children. So open the country back up so we can give our children to others to raise while we go about our business concerned with our careers. And people are becoming depressed and frustrated because they don't know how to deal with the kids that they gave birth to. And they're so used to just sending them off, sending them off, letting other people raise them, letting other people teach them and take care of them. But now that we have to take care of the kids that we brought into the world, Ooh, have mercy. We cannot stand it anymore. Brothers and sisters, I guarantee you when this country opens up, divorces are going to go back up because people have finally realized that they can't live with each other. They're not busy enough to stay married to the person. They don't have enough distractions to continue to be with that person. And now that they get to see that person without these distractions, guess what? There's no interest there. Some relationships have coming, got stronger. Others have been decimated and they're only waiting for the country to open up so they can run back to their lawyers and get themselves out of these marriages. 2008, when the economy went down in the recession, divorces dropped. When it went back up, divorces went back up. Why? Because they didn't have the money in 08 to divorce. But when they got some money, they got out of those relationships. And we're going to see the same thing happening again. And so here, Jesus is inviting the church and they're making excuses. I've married a wife. I cannot come. I'm not allowing, I'm, I'm not bringing my family I'm not interesting, interesting them in the things of God. I want my children to understand how to be successful in this world. I have born the field. I cannot come. I'm more interested in my investments for the future than I am with fulfilling the word of God. Why? Because if I start preaching that message, it will interfere with my investments. This is why we couldn't give out the book, Great Controversy in Washington, D.C., because it would interfere with the contracts of the corporation. I have got me these oxen and I need to go and prove them. I have to keep watch over my 401k. I have to watch for my pension. I have to make sure my social security is in place. I don't have time for the fulfilling of the gospel commission. And Jesus says what is going to happen. Notice what it says. He says in verse uh, uh, seven, and then, and, and the last one was, they rejected and they sought to silence those who were turning their attention to the gospel by pointing out the sins of their distractions. And then Christ says in verse seven, but when the king, verse six, and the remnant took his servants, treated them spitefully and slew them. It says, uh, uh, and slew them, verse seven. But when the king heard thereof, he was angry and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. In other words, God was holding nations at bay. When they rejected the gospel, God moved his hand and allowed those nations to come and take away their church. I wonder brothers and sisters, I wonder where we are in the procession of ages. I wonder brothers and sisters where we are. Have we considered that churches around the world are closed, but we don't care as long as we get to go to work, as long as their income is coming. As long as the government is sending us checks, we don't care if the church is closed because we're just going to go on live stream. We're just going to go on zoom. We're just going to, Hey, we're going to just keep being on a, keep being here. We're just, gonna, we're just going to uh, uh, keep flooding the digital space with these, with these sermons and these messages. We can care less that the churches are open. Why? Because we have no real burden for the people. We just want to entertain them. They're home. Let's entertain them. 
their home. Let's, let's, <clears throat> let's give them something to watch because we're not going to go visit them. We're not going to go and pray with them. We're not going to answer their calls. We're not going to talk to them. We're not going to encourage them. Let's just keep entertaining. So let's do what we can to get on live stream, to get in front of the camera, just so we can song and dance and enter, keep entertaining them until the country opens back up. And hopefully they'll throw us some coins in our hats while we're entertaining them. And this is what's happening, brothers and sisters. Don't allow yourself to be entertained. Press into God's closet. Use this time to know who Jesus really is. Begin to pray and ask God, Lord, do I know? I want to put this in here because I thought about it earlier today. Someone sent me an email and someone said, Pastor Tinsley, I'm confused. And they said, you know, some prominent preachers among us are telling us 27 AD, Jesus, uh, 2027, Jesus is coming. Prominent people among us are telling us in seven, we only have seven years left. Prominent ministers among us are telling us that 2031, because this is what the world is telling us, our natural resources are about to run out. And they say, Pastor, I'm confused. I'm confused because I'm reading through the conflict series. And you know what dawned on me the other day? And I want to say this. See, I pray to God that they're watching. And I want to say to you, it's not that you're confused. It's not that you're confused. See, what's happening is this. Because you're reading through the conflict series, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, great controversy. Because you're reading through these books, <clears throat> now you're beginning to see that this stuff isn't sound. Now you're beginning to see what doesn't make sense because you have, you have found the pattern. And you can say, wait a minute, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, great controversy. This is not making sense. I'm confused. No, you're not confused, brother. You're not confused, my sister. You are actually on the right path because you're reading. And now you can see clearly why, because God says, my word is like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto thy pathway. And now that you can, now that you're reading consistently, and now that you're reading in its order, you can see error a mile away. You're not confused. They are. They're confused. You're not confused. They are. Keep studying, keep reading, keep praying, and keep looking at these things and systematic and putting them in their places. Man, he gave this quotation. Well, put it where it belongs. And when you put it where it belongs, you say, hmm, that don't fit. No, I, oh, no, nah, that's not, not, hey, wait, you know what? I went and read that. And when I read that, it didn't say that. <clears throat> You're not confused. They are. So keep reading, keep studying. And keep doing what, Paul, what the Bereans did. Even when Paul preached, they went to see whether or not that thing was so. And when they saw it, they said, now we believe. Not because you preached it, but because we've seen it. But too many of us are sponges. And when you rub, when you wipe a wet sponge over something, it just grabs anything. It's not, it, it just picks up whatever it touches. And some of us are like sponges. We just go with anything we hear because we don't have a system of truth to run these things through to make sure that it fits. So I want to say, you're not confused, my sister. You're not confused, my brother. Continue to read and God will continue to show you light. Let's come back here. We got to close. We got to close. Notice because we're going somewhere. Notice, go back in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we're setting the stage of what we're going to look at. So in Again, Matthew 24, Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another. In other words, he says, I'm going to pull back my hands <clears throat> and I'm going to let your king that you worship, your nation that you worship, I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to let you worship your king and I'm going to let that king that you voted for and that, and that you believe that has been sent by God, I'm going to let you have him. And I'm going to let them come and take away your city because you're more concerned about them than you are with doing God's will. And so I wonder, I wonder where we are. I wonder where we are. Churches are going to open back up. <clears throat> 
But it doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, if the churches open back up tomorrow. It doesn't matter if they open back up next week or next month. It doesn't matter. What matters is, brothers and sisters, that we can hear the, we can hear the voice at midnight. Because regardless if they open the churches up or not, regardless if they, if they, if they lift the stay-at-home orders or not, regardless if they, if they mandate vaccines or not, there's still a voice that is coming at midnight, and that voice will say, go you out and meet the bridegroom. But I can't. I'm in a stay-at-home order. I can't go out. I, I, if I go out, if I, if I let them see me, they'll vaccine me. If I, if I, if I do so, no, brothers and sisters, we cannot be concerned with what their orders are. We have to make sure that we can hear the voice at midnight because when that voice comes, when that voice says go forth, brothers and sisters, we have no choice but to go forth. Stay at home order, go forth. Lord, they told me, they said I can't go, go forth. But if we're not filling our lamps with oil, if we're like those broken vessels and everything that God tells us is leaking out, is leaking out, then guess what, brothers and sisters? We're not going to hear that voice. And we're going to be wondering why people are becoming excited. And we're going to be saying, why are you so excited? Why do you seem not to care? Uh, what are you reading? What are you doing? And I say, hey, I don't have nothing to give you. Go to him that buy and sell. And rather than staying in the path of light, they're going to leave and go into outer darkness because they're not keeping a peace with the light that God is sending them. And they're not studying to pray, to find what saith the Lord. They're constantly looking to others to give them oil. They're constantly looking for somebody else to fill their lamps. And they're not storing up truth in their hearts. They're not searching to see where they are. They're constantly looking in darkness for light. Let me see what the secret societies are saying about this time. Let me see what the Jesuits are saying about this time. Let me see what all these individuals who are in darkness is telling me that I should be doing in the light. It doesn't make sense, brothers and sisters. How can we say that we're a people of the light? How can we say that God has called us to be watchmen and light bearers and we're constantly looking at what is being said in darkness, trying to bring it into the light? And those of us who say we're in the light, we're constantly feeding on darkness and think we're going to give a true light to the world. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because we're thinking that these individuals are enemies. Hey, they, they may be our enemies, but they're deceived. It says in the book, Acts of the Apostles, read the chapter, uh, uh, Nero, as it dealt with Nero and as Paul was brought in before Nero that final time, and as the crowd was jeering and screaming and clamoring for his blood, what did Paul, it says that all Paul could see was Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary pleading for them. That's all Paul was, he was enraptured with the idea that Jesus died to save these people. And as he stood before Nero, it is said that light from heaven shone upon Nero. And if he had heeded the light, the door of salvation would have been opened to him. But brothers and sisters, again, if we have this conspiratory mindset that we're constantly looking and trying to see what everything is being said in the darkness, we, we have no love for people. We have no desire to see people saved. We're going to do like Paul. We're going to do like Peter when the mob comes. We're going to draw out our swords and we're going to fight and we're going to cut. But Jesus says, put up thy sword. Can I not now call my father and he will not give me 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Why did Jesus say that? As I was going through the book, Desire of Ages, I realized that Jesus realized he had a divine appointment at the cross. There was a thief waiting for him. Jesus had a divine appointment. Peter was thinking about himself and his reputation and his ministry. Jesus was thinking about the purpose of his ministry. Came not I into the world for such a time as this? Am I going to pray that God save me from it? No, but I'm praying that God's name would be glorified. That I, as I go through it, and this was Jesus' purpose. So he had a divine appointment at the cross. 
Why? Because it was there that someone needed to see the light and the burdens of their hearts needed to be washed away. This is why Jesus went to the cross. He wasn't concerned about it. But oh, brothers and sisters, if we do not understand our purpose, then we lose our way and we start looking into darkness for light. What is Trump telling us about the light? What are, these, what, are, what, are, what are these people in darkness telling us about the light rather than trying to find the light with the light? Notice, let's close, let's close. Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 24. So as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples said, Lord, this surely has to be the end of the world. You're talking about destruction of the temple. And then Jesus began to speak in a way that did not throw upon their minds too much. He revealed to them the truth, but he put it in a manner that they, under the influence of the Spirit of God, would have to go and study for themselves. They would have to go and look line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and they will have to understand where they are in the procession of ages. Now, brothers and sisters, he goes down and he says this to them, Look what it says in Matthew uh, chapter 24. Look at verse 15. Look what he says in Matthew 24. And he wants, and he says in verse 15, because watch this. He says, Matthew 24 and verse 15, it says, When ye, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand then let them, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him that which is upon the housetop come not down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child and give suck in those days." So they said specifically, Lord, when shall these things be? Jesus began to talk about series of events. And then he throws in, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Mark says, here it says, uh, um, standing in the holy place. Mark says, standing where it ought not, the abomination that is going to bring about a desolation for the people of God. When you see it where it should not be in connection with God's people, then just know that this desolation is coming. And when you see it, he says, flee into the mountains. Now, many individuals, again, you can read this in Mark 13. You can read it in Luke 21. He explains it. He goes into detail. But he says, when you see it as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So in other words, you would need to go back to the book of Daniel to understand these events so that you know exactly where you are and what you ought to be doing. Let's look at one more. One more. Go in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Watch this, brothers and sisters. Again, we're setting up for where we're actually going to go with this. Now, watch. Now, he says that when you see this, he says, flee. Now, Prior to that, verse 14, we did not read it. You're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to stay there. But in verse 14, he says, And this gospel shall be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. Now, the question is, Jesus gave a commission, Matthew 28, to go to all the world. When you see this abomination, he says, flee. Why? Into the mountain. For what? To hide? No. Because this, inf this abomination is being set up with the intent to stop you from going to the world with this gospel. God wants his people to be in a position where they are not held up from preaching the gospel. This was Satan's purpose. He wants to stop the proclamation of the truth. And so God is saying, when you see these things, you must be in a position to continue to preach. And brother says, that's a broad, that's a, that's a, mm, that's a, that's a, there's a mouthful in that. 
because it's not just talking about us in and of ourselves, meaning we have to train others to carry the work on, not carry on me, but carry on the work. We have to train others that can continue to preach, because Christ says, not only baptizing them, and te- he says, but teaching them, you have to make disciples so that they can make other disciples. <clears throat> so, and so as we see this, we have to be intentional about putting people into the work that can keep the work moving forward because there's a field that needs to hear the truth. Watch this. Second Thessalonians chapter two, second Thessalonians chapter two, we're closing here. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one, he says, now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Watch this. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. Watch this. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Christ will not come until there is a great apostasy. That falling away is where you get, we get that word today, apostasy. Until there is a great apostasy, a departing from the truth, and the man of sin is revealed. So what brings about the man of sin? It is the apostasy. It is the rottenness of the church abandoning its position. And as a result, it makes room for the opposition. So what happens is there's a great apostasy that must take place. Brothers and sisters, that apostasy is actively in place now. Now watch this. It says, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of destruction, the desolation power, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God. Now I want you to jump down, verse 6. Only now, notice this, and now, and now, not only, and now ye know what withholdeth, and that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What Paul is showing us here, he's showing a dual application of Revelation 13, Revelation 17. He says, the day is not coming until this power is revealed, but this power is not going to be revealed, one, until apostasy takes place, and now that which is with keeping it from developing is moved as well. So there has to be a political shift and a religious shift for the development of this power. And what you and I are seeing and what we're living in is the political and the religious shifting is taking place. There's an adjusting taking place to reveal the man of sin. Now what has to happen, brothers and sisters, is that you and I must be in a position where God can use us. And we find an example of how God would have his people to work in the development of this power, we find it in the book of Daniel. Daniel shows us how, what our message is, and he's to show us what our methods are in order to accomplish the finishing of God's working. So Daniel does not just reveal prophecies, Daniel reveals methodologies of how this work is to be finished by those who are living in the judgment scene. This is what we're going to begin to look at. 
Daniel as a blueprint for the people of God in the time of the judgment. Daniel, the blueprint for the people of God in the time of the judgment. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit to fix us where we cannot be moved. Father, we pray that you would guide us, that you would so fill us with the love, not only for thy truth, but for the people you died to save. Lord, may our mouths be filled with messages of peace. May we receive the tongue of the learned. Father, wake us, awaken us out of our stupor. Moment by moment, day by day, that we may know how to speak a word in season to those that are weary. Lord, we ask that you would work within us, that we might both choose and live for you. Keep us, dear God, for we cannot keep ourselves. We are not above, above being deceived by self. Wash us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's continue to be prayerful.